Welcome to another episode of the Outside Insights Podcast. My goal is to provide content and ideas that help folks close their personal and professional gaps from learning from others. I'm your host, Chris Burkhardt, and today I'm thrilled to have John Ratliff on the show. Welcome, John. Hey, Chris. Hey, it's great. So I know we share a common connection or two, and we've been in the mid-Atlantic, East Coast, United States. It's not that I have a global audience, but I know you have a global following to a degree with what you do. But I just wanted to start by saying I admire what you've achieved as an entrepreneur and a leader, not just for what you've accomplished, but I've always admired your strong commitment to values and just that you never compromise on your beliefs. And I just wanted you to know that, and I really appreciate the way you go about doing things. I appreciate that. Thanks. So you have a great story. You do many things today. CEO, trusted advisor, investment banker, entrepreneur, thought leader, connector, pilot. I figured we could introduce you together, but I know you're currently the founder of Align5, a strategic consulting business, an M&A partner. It's got a great co-working space. You serve as CEO of Scaling Up Coaches. Could you bring this to life a little bit? <laughs> yeah, that's too much. <laughs> it's that's, a lot. That's, so that's it, bringing it to life. There's a way to ease it in. Yeah. Now, so, you know, I think the thread that runs through all of those things is I got really lucky early in my career. So I, I started a call center company from scratch in 1995 when I was the tender age of 23, 24 years old and struggled a lot. Uh, I was 24-7, 365. I actually rented an apartment, lived there, and I ran it out of the apartment. In the middle of the night when the phone would ring, a buzzer would go off, and it would wake me up, like, out of a dead sleep. And so There wasn't a string on the toe. It was a buzzer. It was a buzzer, yeah, which right. my neighbors loved because I was oh. the only commercial space. They were all residential, so I'd wake them up, too. They were, they were, Yeah, they were huge fans of mine, for sure. But... I, you know, I, I did that for six or seven years, and then I was lucky enough, we, we bought equipment from a vendor that happened to have a users group. So I was able to join this users group for this equipment platform, and it was the first time in my life that I really discovered that, you know, there were other people that had chosen the entrepreneurial path that were kind of doing what I was doing, and making similar mistakes because I was really that was my core competency was making really dumb mistakes I was really good at that were you repeating and, them John or were they you, you know, know yeah repeated a lot of them for sure. sure um but I thought I was the only dumb dumb that I wow. knew and and then I met you know kind of my tribe of dumb dumb so I realized from that group that was kind of the first time getting to see that you know, there, there's a lot of people that didn't understand how to hire great people. They didn't understand how to lead and how to inspire people and, and how to find customers and all the, all the stuff that I wasn't great at. They were struggling with similar things. And, and it was in that community of people that I started to get a sense of, you know, a, a couple things. One, being an entrepreneur is a lonely life at times. And you know, it's a little bit on an island. And, you know, for a lot of us, our friends that are teachers and lawyers and, and chose different career paths, you can talk to them, but it's hard to find, a you know, a, a, one of those friends that really kind of gets it. Um, and so there's not, and you can't talk to your employees because you're busy pretending you know what the hell you're doing so that they don't abandon ship. And, um, so you can't really talk to that and it, it, it gets really lonely. So when I first found that, that kind of group, it, it was the, it was the first time I had a little bit of a lifeline, um, to figure some stuff out. And I really feel like I've spent, you know, that, that was, God, I hate to say it. That was almost 30 years ago. And I've really spent the last 30 years sort of paying it forward. Cause I had some people that, kind of mentored me and took me under their wing in those, you know, very, very precarious early days. And I felt like I was lucky enough to find some of those people that really probably saved me from complete failure. And I've spent 
you know, the, the rest of my time sort of trying to pay that forward for others. And, um, you know, I think that philosophy that, that came from my grandparents, it came from my parents that, you know, if, if someone helps you out along the way, it's your responsibility and, and your, and your privilege to help other people kind of share what you know. So, uh, I don't take credit for the idea. I, I certainly give credit to my ancestors for the idea, but, um, you know, I've always tried to take that approach because I, I was lucky enough to have that happen for me early on. So, yeah, I, I I do the things that I do today and I do the things that I've done over the last, you know, decade or two to, to try and help other entrepreneurs that are on that lonely, heroic, really important journey, uh, maybe avoid some of the mistakes that I made. Uh, it, it It's good to make some of them, Chris, but you don't need to make all of them to learn the lessons. You can certainly learn from others. And uh, I, if I can do that, you know, I didn't my, my litmus test is if I have a day where I can help someone avoid doing something dumb in the entrepreneurial universe, then my day was a success. So I didn't invent it, but if I can reduce the, or we can reduce the drama in business, that's a good thing. Agree. Uh, uh, and cause we've, I think I've been the chief drama officer at times, you know, <laughs> I've never really thought of that before, but, you know, you know, create the theater act and then act in it and then tell everybody about it, you know? Yeah, uh, for exactly. What so, and, and, you know, you wake up and you want to do the best you can. And when, when the buck stops with you, it's really hard to make, you know, all really good optimal decisions. So you're going to, you're going to drop the ball. You're going to make mistakes and, you know, it comes with the job, but you know, if you can help someone else make a, you know, a few, a few less then you know, then our, our work is meaningful. And I think you feel the same. So that's why I think we're kindred souls on this, uh, on this journey to be a hero to entrepreneurs. So well, I think I'm much more comfortable today with candor, with admitting failure, uh, with saying, I don't know, um of asking for help um yeah. you know, i don't know where that comes from right it's at some point uh, maybe i feel like i've got nothing to prove by going it alone like that or you know i don't know there's just i i so from from you obviously um do a lot with a line five and with scaling up i'm in the scaling up coaching business and in essence, uh, part of John's organization. Do you want to touch on any of those things? Anything you've got that are a passion for right now that you'd like to bring to light a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. You talk about scaling up. It's about 250 plus or minus people like us around the world and, and literally around the world, six continents, uh, 40 plus countries that wake up every day to help middle market growth company entrepreneurs be better, run better companies, be better employers, be better, you know, spouses, be better parents. It's, it kind of covers the whole gamut. And if you really dig deep on, you know, certainly Main Street USA and startups play a role and, you know, the global 2500, the big companies around the world certainly play an important role. But uh, the middle market gets, I think, abused and forgotten a lot of times. We're we're too big to be the darling of Main Street USA and the startup ecosystem, and we're too small to have any real ability to have lobbyists or or a, a, a ton of influence. Yet we create seven out of ten jobs on the planet. So we're getting we're getting pounded on by the big guys, and we're getting forgotten by you know, the, the, <clears throat> the politicians at all that, you know, help the startups and the, and the things that look good on, on their political resumes. And, and we got to gut it out without a lot of help. So uh, Scaling Up Coaches organization is kind of one of those groups that, that really offers a lot of help and guidance and advice to that, what I call unsung hero of the, uh, of the global economy. During during the pandemic, it, they were kind of the, the middle market was kind of the first responder of the the global economy. It it was you know the it was the entrepreneur that really led us out of that. I think you know the the darkest days of that. It, it wasn't 
corporate America who was too busy worrying about risk mitigation to figure anything out. And it, it wasn't startups by any stretch. It was was people like you and me that got up every day and said, all right, I, we've never seen this before, but we've seen a lot of other crap. We'll figure this one out too. And, and the scaling up coaches organization is a group of people that are really committed. About 4,000 companies are being coached by, by a scaling up coach that are really committed to helping the middle market. And, you know, the research is clear. When you help the middle market, you help local economies, you help regional economies, and in a lot of cases, you, you create stability in second and third world countries. It all happens kind of at that middle market level. So um, it's a tough customer to serve. It's a tough group to, you know, to, to really have a lot of influence over. But our community does a lot of that work. And uh, it's something that I know you're proud to be part of it. I'm proud to be part of it. And, um, you know, it's definitely important work. We don't doing, get a lot of press, Chris. No, you, know, I, you know, and I was naive. I thought, I thought so naive. I just thought that that would be noticed. Um, yeah, you know, I've, and but the way you've characterized it, just my my Cheshire cat smile was like, oh, that's uh, it's like a reflection as to explain what what's going on a little bit. And I was thinking a little bit about like, I mean, for 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 me and for my clients it was just about getting up every day having to make the most ridiculous calls and the most challenging decisions and some of it was innovation and r d but it was really i i was too big to hide and too small to fold you know it was the yeah. yeah. kind of in between so uh, I, um you want to touch on a line five or it is, is uh enough on scale yeah so so line five is kind of an extension of that philosophy. So, you know, it, it's a little bit confusing, but a, a line five is a practitioner of scaling up. So we coach using the scaling up methodology. We've got about a dozen or so clients we coach directly. And then we have a co-working space in Westchester, Pennsylvania, uh, about 150 members that kind of are aligned around that idea of having a cool place to go every day to build their companies. Um, we've got members that are here, you know, once or twice a week, we have members that actually office out of here. And then we also help because when you look at the middle market uh, as a collective, you know, there's, there's a lot written on marketing and finance and hiring and firing and, and kind of the mechanics of how to run a growth company scaling up certainly is a book, you know, obviously written by Vern Harnish about how to scale a growth company. One of the real gaps, one of the real knowledge gaps for the middle market is around when it comes time to exit the business. Now, exit doesn't necessarily mean sell. It could mean passing it on to the next generation. It could mean passing it on to employees. It could even mean shutting the business down. But here's the dirty secret. Even the ones that don't think they ever will, every entrepreneur ultimately is going to exit their company. Unless someone cracks the code on immortality, yep. it's going to happen. And our philosophy is you either choose the way that it happens or it's chosen for you. And you want to be an active participant in the strategy around exit. So one of the big things that Align 5 does is help the middle market entrepreneur navigate that most important moment which is the exit event. You know, we, we say running a great company is, is really about building income, but selling a company is the event where you create wealth, hopefully multi-generational wealth. And it's the one that gets screwed up the most. Um, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of very unscrupulous buyers. You look at the rise of private equity and I'm not here to say all private equity is unscrupulous, but I can say that there are every single day, many, 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 many times a day, private equity firms buying entrepreneurial led companies that are not favorable to entrepreneurs. Um, there, there's a reason that private equity has garnered a 25% plus compounded annual return and that's they don't necessarily do 
kind of the best by the entrepreneur. They're in the business to buy companies for less than they're worth, improve them, and then sell them for as much or more than they're worth. And the collateral damage oftentimes in that process is the entrepreneur. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can still produce outlier returns for investors and take care of entrepreneurs along the way. And we feel like as a third party, one of the big parts of our mission is to help the entrepreneur not get taken by an un, uh, in an unsuspected way by an unscrupulous buyer. And it's, it's not just private equity. I, I use that to illustrate the example, but there are lots of buyers out there that, that are not acting in the seller's best interest. And there are ways to create win-win, and I know that's a cliche, way overused, but there are really are ways to create win-win transactions. And Align 5 is really skilled at helping both sellers who are our clients, we only serve middle market entrepreneurs selling their companies, but we also help buyers understand and see the value in the clients that we take to market and make sure that the buyers are in win-win positions as well. So this isn't about, we have an orange and we're trying to get the very last drop of juice out of it. It's about how do you find a group of buyers or an individual buyer that will benefit from buying our client, who is the seller, in a in a productive way. And that's one of the things. We're, we're amazingly good at getting outlier valuations for the sellers, for our clients. I mean, we... If we only beat market value by 50%, I actually feel like we failed. But in, I can't think of one, so I will say just about every, but I think it's in every transaction I've been a part of, the seller has done extremely well also. Even paying a premium price, understanding the strategy and why these assets are valuable and, and us, helping guide them in the buying process, even though we represent the seller, not the buyer, we've always been able to find buyers that can extract the value that, um, that we represent over and above just the financial value. So I, I actually take that really personally as well, that we're not trying to bilk the buyer any more than we're trying to make sure the seller's not taken advantage of. We're trying to put two parties together that can create something bigger than they have individually. So that's that's kind of a long-winded explanation yeah. of line five. John, I've heard you talk about uh, your Rembrandt, Rembrandt in the attic. And yeah. I think about being an entrepreneur and I mean, please poke fun at this. I, I love to tell people what my strategic value is worth, realizing yeah. what a, there's my dumb, dumb moment, right? Like, I mean, but it's taken me now a few years to listen to you and to realize that no no because i know my business and everything i want to tell you what you should do with it um yeah and i'm just beginning to understand that you know the no no of that if you will yeah well and if you'd like me to share what rembrandt in the attic means i actually believe it is the single most important thing that i teach and i also think because i'm biased and very opinionated, as you know. And mod- I think it's the single very, most important thing extremely mod- for entrepreneurs yeah. to understand. It's that important. So I always use the analogy, imagine you're going to buy a house, right? Let's say let's say you and I are, are in the market to buy a home, and we both found the same home, and it's listed for a million dollars. And they listed it for a million dollars because the realtor said, this house in this neighborhood is worth about a million bucks. And the seller of the house said, yep, I agree. I think it's worth about a million bucks. And you and I are going to bid on that house. And we show up to see the house and we both really like it. You might like the kitchen a little bit more than I do. So maybe you'd be willing to pay a million one. And I might not love the backyard and we're looking at something else. So maybe I'd be willing to pay 950000 But we're right in the ballpark. Right of a million dollars and then we go we look at the house and i happen to wander up into the attic and i i'm in the attic and i'm looking around and i see hidden behind this pillar in the attic is an original rembrandt 
and the seller of the house doesn't know that it's there. And you didn't bother to wander up into the attic because you like the kitchen so much and you are willing to pay over asking price. But I know the Rembrandts in the attic. Who's going to be the winning bidder for the house? A, the seller has the house listed for way less than it's worth because the Rembrandts in the attic they don't know about. Happens all the time in business. You don't know that it's there. So you're not going to, I'm not going to get outbid by you. I'd be willing, the Rembrandt's worth 20 million. I'd be willing to pay 10 or 12 or 15 million because the Rembrandt comes with the house and it's happening in business every single day. Owners of companies have Rembrandt's hidden up in their attic that they either don't know they're there or they don't know the value of that particular. And it could be a capability. It could be some software they created. It could be the products and services that they either represent or, or, or manufacture. It could be their customer list. So imagine you have all Fortune 500 customers and I have all middle market customers. And I know my product would be perfect for Fortune 500, but I can't figure out, figure out how to get in. And I buy your company and all of a sudden I get all those relationships. Well, that's a Rembrandt to me. That's worth more than just the financial value of your business to me. But I'm one buyer. Another buyer might like a piece of software that you created. And they know with that software and their business, they can create all this value. So different buyers will see different Rembrandts in your attic. They will value different things over and above the financial value of your business to them only to them and it's unique to them if you don't understand what's up there and to your point you don't want to tell them what they're worth you want to ask a lot of questions and let them tell you what they think they're worth and reverse engineer the value of that rembrandt to that buyer the other, every business has them the other every screwed, single business. screwed up thing is sometimes i don't like my rembrandt yeah. If I'm smart enough to figure it out, I don't like my Rembrandt. So, you know, how dumb yeah. is that, right? But, you know, I'm just sharing, like, the the mental stuff I go through. And, and that assumes I'm smart enough to to find it. I know I realize that's the point of it. You work with someone objective to extract it. But these are the things yeah. I think about on these concepts, you know? You know, one of, one of the things, one of the hidden kind of ways to find some of them is oftentimes it's what you said, it's something you're sick of because you've been doing it so well for so long, it's boring. Or you're so good at it and it's so core to who you are and what your company's about, you take it for granted. And you just assume everybody does it that way. We were, we were doing an exercise with a guy and they're in the apparel business. They sell specialty apparel. And we're doing a Rembrandt discovery exercise. So we're, we're talking through all the different things that might be Rembrandts to a buyer. And we're 90 minutes into the conversation, 90 minutes, an hour and a half. And he makes a passing comment out of like, just total took for granted passing comment about the end cap display that they had invented for Walmart. And I said, it took 90 minutes. I said, wait, back up a second. What What do you mean the end cap? He's like, oh, yeah, well, Walmart didn't display. They were T-shirts. He's like, Walmart couldn't figure out how to display our T-shirts. And we went round and round for years with them. And, they, you know, so finally we just created this end cap display where it stretches out the shirt so you can see the front of it. And it's got shelves and and, you know, they, they put them at the end of the, the aisle, which is by far the most valuable and expensive real estate in a Walmart. And he's like, they love them because, you know, we show up and we merchandise them. And it takes like five minutes, what used to take two hours of merchandising. And he was talking about it like it was no big deal. So I start to think, well, who else might want the end cap at Walmart for their crap to sell to people? Their stuff. Sorry, I shouldn't say crap. For their stuff. That was like one, of, and, and I've done a lot of Rembrandt discoveries with a lot of companies. It might have been one of the biggest of all time. They were so good at it, and it was so part of what they were, and they so took it for granted that he didn't, as a, 
as I'm it's asking an him, afterthought. what do you think? Yeah. yeah, what do you think, Vic, that might be something, you know, that you guys do that's a differentiate? 90 minutes before he mentioned it, totally in passing. So well, a lot of times, yeah, you, you don't see them because you're inside the milk bottle. And it's helpful to have someone from outside to say, hey, by the way, that thing you do at Walmart, a lot of people would kill to have that capability. That capability, that single thing, he was about, a, I think about a 5 million EBITDA company. That end cap thing at Walmart was worth more than the entire company. So that's how important the Rembrandts you think can be. That kind of discovery should be an annual thing for a business. Uh, Here's what I'll say. Yes. And once you know this concept, like once someone, li there will be someone hopefully that listens to this. Well, you've ruined me. This. You've ruined me. You know? Yes. Yes. Once you know, you can't not know. Oh. So once you know about this idea, you will start seeing them everywhere. And this is the kind of thing where everyone's scared to get their leadership team involved because they think, well, if the leadership team thinks we're going to sell the company, that's why we're looking for these Rembrandts. You don't have to position it that way. What you can position it as is, hey, what are the things that we're so good at that we take for granted that we might be able to extract more value from in our business? So, so you don't have to couch it as, hey, I'm going to sell the company. You're all going to lose your jobs. Now help me do that by finding the Rembrandts in our attic. You That's make it a strategic way. planning yeah. exercise, not a, not a we're going to sell the company exercise. And it's fun for the leadership team to think through who might value this and what to, why would they value it and what can we do internally to get value out of it as well. So I'll use the I'll use the Walmart end cap example. And instead of Vic going to his team and saying, Hey, I'm thinking about selling the company, let's think about all the things that other people might want to buy if we sold the company. He could say, Hey, what are some of the things we're so good at that if another company had that capability, they'd be able to use it? Maybe we can learn from that other company and we can use it internally. So in his case, what other products might go on that? We're in the t-shirt business, but what's adjacent? You know, maybe we, maybe we sell some other consumable product and what other, what company could we acquire that use, that could use that end cap if we bought that company? So you can do it in reverse yes. and get your management team engaged in the, you don't, you don't have to say we're, this company's for sale to do the discovery. And it's fun. It's like it's it's a any to me any thought exercise that stretches your creativity is fun to do. So you, you approach it from that yeah. perspective as a creative endeavor, not a you're all going to lose your jobs when we sell this company endeavor. So does that make sense? I love the mindset behind it, and you know, I, I I'm anyone will anyone listening. Uh, we'll make sure you've you've written about this, right? So we could put something in the show notes. We could put a link if someone wants to see a little bit more about that. And and I certainly know you have links to videos that we can be sure and include. Um, shifting. Your yeah, we actually Chris shot a course on this. Kind of, it's like an hour long, but it's kind of how to think about okay the Rembrandt process. But we have we've written a bunch about Kristen. You yep, know, our, our superstar yep. chief of staff, Kristen, she's got it all. So just if you want to, she, she can give you all the links there. Oh, make sure we have the links because I think that's what people really look for is the idea. And then how do I go get more on it? So if you've got a course on it, there's a reason for that. And I'm not sure there's anything. If you're thinking about this, I can't think of anything else that would be more important to consider. The biggest thing is just understanding the idea that your business is worth, and it's probably a great segue, your business is worth what one buyer, but like we always talk about industry, well, my industry trades at seven times EBITDA, great. Your business is worth what one buyer is willing to pay. I came out of the call center space. I bought 24 call centers. The most we ever paid was four times EBITDA. That was the industry average multiple, three and a half. We paid three and a half, 80% of the time. A couple of times we paid four and a couple of times we paid three. 
Like that was it. Yeah. We sold for 14 and a half times EBITDA because one buyer at one point in time needed a few things that we had. One was our ability to buy companies at four times and some others. And that capability mattered more than the cash flow of the business. So they paid some industry average for our cash flow, and then they paid triple that for the capabilities we had that they needed. Then they were able to take those capabilities and turn them into value for them. So that's a that's a mindset too. Get this, our industry trades at X. That's great to know where you stand at a baseline, but your goal is to beat the industry average. I think I said earlier, if, if we only beat the average by 50%, I feel like we failed because we didn't find good Rembrandts and we didn't position them with the right buyers. And that's how you beat the industry. How, how many entrepreneurs do you think that successfully grow their own business can successfully sell their own business on their own? Do you know anybody that's ever done it? Because it's different. I, I know it. Different. I know a handful, and I would even say the handful that I know that had successful exits by not understanding this and having someone help position them with a buyer left. Even though they had great outcomes, they all left a lot on the table oh. by trying to go it alone and do it. Even with even with good outcomes, they they left a lot on the table by trying to go it alone and not have someone else reverse engineer the value of their Rembrandts with the buyer groups. Um, so, John, and that. Again, I, I sound biased no, probably, no, it's the, that, but I've seen it. It's the point of this. Um, we have time for probably one more big theme. What do you want to cover? I've submitted just some questions. What, what, what's on your mind that you'd like to cover and take 15 minutes? If not, I'll ask you a question, but I know you and I know what. That yeah. Means. Yeah. And. And I read, obviously read through the questions and some, some things kind of came to mind that I think I, I love the holistic approach. Like this whole idea of like work is work and personal is personal. And like, even at, even at the frontline employee level, that's nonsense. But at the entrepreneur level, like it's all integrated and there's no balance, by the way, that's a myth. Work-life balance. There's no balance. You're always out of balance one way or the other. You're either you're either working way too hard or you're slacking off or you're you're always at some and level John, of John, you're always carrying it. You're always. 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 Even when you're slacking yes. off, you're carrying it. You know? Yes. And so so from that framework, that mindset, looking through that lens, I we talked about it when we first started. I kind of want to double down on it now. It's a heroic and noble pursuit to be an entrepreneur, but you've chosen a lonely path. And I think there's increased rates of depression. There's increased rates of addiction and substance abuse. There's certainly increased rates of suicide among our peer group. And we're all manic. And I think and we're all manic just to. Yes. Yes. I, I, I sat in a room once with Cameron Harold from 1-800-GOT-JUNK fame and, and more, and Cameron read off nine traits, and, and he said, if if this trait sounds like you, put your hand up. And um, for me, eight of the nine, for most people, it was five or six of the nine. For some people, it was all nine. And when he got done, he said, I just read you the Merck manual definition of bipolar disorder. <laughs> Those are the nine traits of bipolar disorder. And there wasn't a person in the room that, that wasn't at least half of them. And I was eight ninths of them. So it is, it's, it's a, it, it's a roller coaster ride. And one of the things that I, that I think is our, again, responsibility, privilege, mission is to help entrepreneurs understand that it's okay. It's okay to be lonely. It's okay to not have the answer. And so, and you you alluded to it earlier. As we get older, we, we care a whole lot less about being right all the time and 
not looking like we don't know and being willing to say the most powerful words you can ever say as a leader are, I don't know. Let's figure that out together. Help me. <laughs> and go yeah, ahead. Just help me. You know, no, you're right. yeah. yeah, I don't know. Let's I don't know. work on this. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never, I mean, I, I don't think until I was 35, I ever said good question. I don't know. And let's figure that out together. I, and had I would have saved a whole lot of headache uh, along the way. So it's a process we love to give self confidence, people... I think, or an, a comfort in your own skin. I don't know. It's a transformation. I, I think it's imposter syndrome and fear that I, there's this irrational fear that if we don't have all the answers, our team is going to abandon us. They're going to lose confidence and faith in us, and they're going to go away. Now. You, you got to be smart. You got to make good decisions. You got to be strategic. You got to be empathetic. Like there's a lot of skills you got to bring to the table, but knowing everything being, you know, omniscient is not one of them and being humble enough or confident enough or whatever it is enough to say, I have no freaking idea. Let's, let's figure that out. I think you get more kind of collective, uh, loyalty from that approach than you'll ever get from the know it all. And God, and no, we go know ahead. a team brain is better, right? Aligning around yeah. a team brain. Uh, John, I'll, I'll go. I still, if I have an hour on my calendar with nothing going on, it drives me insane. And I have to go find something to do and make something happen for that imposter thing. Yeah. You know, and I'm 55 years old and been running a company for 23 years. So it's, yeah. There's bad ticks, you know? I know. Well, yeah, and you and I have talked at length about this, too, about the, the guilt that if you're not the one turning the lights on and turning the lights off, that you're somehow letting everybody else down. And, you know, it's it, nobody nobody that's watching you turn the lights on and the lights off is asking you about the stress of having all these families' futures in your hands and, you know, being one or two bad decisions away from, you know, being out on the street. Like it's, it's a tightrope walk and it's a lonely life. And that comes with the need to take care of us and our energy and ourselves. And so many times we, we eschew that because we have these weird sort of like hangups about what we're supposed to be. And we, we play a part, almost car cartoon characters, of what we believe versus being authentic. And it doesn't serve anyone to be inauthentic, and it certainly doesn't serve us. So we always like to give the, the entrepreneur permission to, to be real, be authentic. Listen, if, you, if, if you're having a, a terrible week or a ter and you want to stay in bed and put the covers over your head, it's okay. Like... People get it. You're a human being and people get it. And once it's so empowering, once you like cross that and it's a, it's a thin line, but once you get over that line and you realize that you're not alone and, and there are others that have, have, you know, walked the path and it, it, it goes a really, it, you, it doesn't eliminate the depression, the substance abuse risk and the suicide risk, but man, it sure, it sure diminishes it a little bit. And that's got to be the goal for all of us is to, you know, is to diminish that a little bit and find some grace and joy in what we do. Because I, I, I have a theory, too, Chris, around that because I, I struggle with depression still. And, and at different times throughout my life, it was it was overwhelming. And I think part of what led us to be entrepreneurs is we found something we were dissatisfied about and we set out to fix it. So I think there's a wiring thing. We've self-selected into this life and this lifestyle through being dissatisfied in some ways. And I think that's why our statistics are so grim around those depression. So, and, so we and have to stay dissatisfied. Perhaps. We do, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that we're biased in that way. Yeah. And I think we need to give ourselves some grace and not be dissatisfied about everything all the time. Just know that we come from a place of, you see a problem, we're wired to fix it. 
a lot of people see a problem and they're wired to walk right on the hell by and not care. And wow. that's that's not most entrepreneurs that I we know. Walk into the they fire. can't walk by a problem. Yeah. And that's why they're in the role that they're in. And once you again, one of my favorite sayings, once you know, you can't not know. So once you know you're wired that way, that you can't walk by a problem and you're wired to be dissatisfied, you can't not know. So you can at least deal with it in a different mindset. So, Mindset's along those lines, critical. and it's a, a vulnerable question, but I think we're both in the right headspace. How are, how do you, I mean, you've got a unique set of responsibilities and 250 coaches and 4,500 companies and a lot of employees. So in terms of self-care, mental health, taking care of yourself, how much of that is a part of your leadership message? How much do you do for you? How much do you carry that? I mean, because you've got a, a big community that you serve. Yeah. It, you know, it's such an interesting paradox and, and something I'm super excited about. And I've been talking a lot. Of, you know, I write a weekly email. I think you get my weekly emails, and I've been talking about this. I'm weekly. one of those geeks that responds um, to you, so you know, which I which I greatly appreciate. By the way, every time I get a response, I'm like, oh, thank God, somebody's so reading this. this. But, yeah, but one of the things I think that, and I I talked in the beginning about luck. I was lucky enough to have some mentors. One of the other really interesting things about choosing this life and this path. I also believe that we're lucky enough to get exposed to big thinking and, and different ideas than the vast majority of people get exposed to. I, I, whether it's around health or well-being or energy management or if you're a learner and, and again, they all go together like a, like a crazy puzzle. You're dissatisfied. You can't walk by a problem. You, you you love to create things, you love to build, and you, you you know you've chosen this path. One of the other things is you've got to be a lifelong learner, and as a lifelong learner, you seek out groups to learn from. And a lot of the groups that we're part of, Scaling Up, Genius Network, Strategic Coach, all these all these places where us weirdos gather, there's a lot of really weirdo good energy around big thinking and new ideas. So what I try and do is I try and distill a lot of what I feel like I've been lucky enough to be exposed to that the vast majority of people don't get to hear about. Like, we don't teach goal setting in school. We don't teach intentionality in school. We don't teach energy management in school. We learn those things post-school by being part of these big thinking groups. And I try and bring a lot of that back to our team here, the people we serve through Scaling Up, the people we serve through Align 5. And a lot of it falls on, on kind of unsuspecting ears that don't want to listen. But at the same time, I think we're in a position to be kind of discerners of big ideas and we can share those things. So that's part of how so I think I go Would you say it. discerner or aggregator or both? Both. Okay. Yeah, both. Yeah, and yeah, because aggregating it without discernment is just kind of spamming. So I think, yeah, we definitely aggregate, yep. but we also, I think, run them through our own internal filters and some stuff resonates and some, some stuff but doesn't. But it also feels to me like a form of self-care because it helps, Absolutely. It helps create a narrative. Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 I, I guess I'm projecting on you a little bit. I don't take as I try to take it all in and decide what it means uh, or, or how it, what it could yeah. mean. Well, and the, and learning to me is a gift and it's a gift that we should all nurture for a lifetime, not for the 15 or 17 or 20 years that we're in some form of schooling and being educated. And yeah, so self care around learning is, is absolutely like they go hand in hand to me. And, you know, you, you uh, all the blue zone, octager, centigenarian studies, everything. There's there's a couple of threads that wind through, and diet in various forms might be one of them, but they're all curious. They're all learners. They're all people that looked at their their 100-plus-year journey as a never-ending stream of, of new ideas and new thinking and 
new things. And that's the self-care of it more than anything else. Maybe so, being curious, continuous. Curiosity. That, you know, leading up to the pandemic, I I really thought drive and tenacity were the most important and tolerance for risk. I, I probably had a list of 10 things that I thought were, were critical skills for entrepreneurs. And creativity was on the list, but it was probably in the top five. It certainly wasn't first. I stand by since March of 2020, and I will stand on this desk and it might shout be good it right radio. now. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. <laughs> I think the most important skill that an entrepreneur can possess is creativity, and yeah. curiosity is is the is the benevolent twin of creativity. I really believe that in this new world that we live in you have to be a creative to to create something amazing and creativity like to solve problems in this we we are now at a place where technology moves faster than comprehension so we can't comprehend the pace of change anymore i think innovations moving faster than comprehension change is moving faster than comprehension so the, the skill that helps you manage that is creativity. And creativity is pattern recognition. It's the ability to connect the dots. It's the ability to see things where others can't see things. And then learning underpins all of that. But if you're not curious and you're not learning, you're not, you're not nurturing your creativity. And for me, it's a great virtuous circle that all compounds on itself, but creativity is at the heart of all of it. My own, my own so. take on what you said is that I only ever see that when people are starting a business and they're finding their market. But of course, it goes on and on because of the pace of change and the shift of markets and the shift of services and the shift of technology. It's very, very well said and, and just terrific. I, I have a, yeah. a typical closing question that I'm going to change for you, John. Okay. So I normally ask, okay. what would you say to your 21 year old self but i feel like i have to make it your 24 year old self for for some odd reason but you yep. can answer it either way but you know whoever whoever responds will listen to yeah you know i i've been asked this question many times and I, i'm probably inconsistent i'm wondering if i mean i'd be i'd be curious yeah to go back and see how consistent i am in my answer, the obvious question that that comes to mind is the the highs are not as good as they seem, and the lows are not as bad. And you know that's the stock answer, right? John, it's, in fact, it's they never, look a lot alike. Yeah, and it's never as bad as it seems. And the benefit of hindsight always gives you clarity and and you know the the ability to be introspective. And I, I'm sure I've answered that question before, but I've also said I know in the past as an answer to this question, um, I go back to Dan Sullivan who talks about the gap where, you know, as as entrepreneurs, we're always setting new targets out in front and of the us. The damn and goalposts. Yes. And they're always, and it's like the, the Dan describes it as the horizon, okay. right? You get in a boat, you're sailing towards the horizon. The horizon are your goals. And as you near the horizon and near those goals, the horizon's moving away from you. So there's a new set of goals and a new horizon. And we live in a constant state of dissatisfaction because even though we're achieving the original horizon, the original goals that we set, we've always got our eye towards the next and the next and the next. And Dan's mental image, and, and one that I've carried with me since the day that he said it, um, is every once in a while you need to stand up in the boat. And well, first off, when you pass one of those horizons and a goal, you got to drop a buoy in the water. And every once in a while, you got to stand up in the boat and turn around and look at the string of buoys that you've left behind, the, the accomplishments and the milestones. And the joy is in the gap. The joy is in the journey towards those new goals and those new milestones. And my 21 and 24-year-old and 
I'm 53, 52 year old and 51 year old and 50 year old self never really fully grasped the importance of that lesson. So I would tell all the prior versions of myself, the joy is in the journey and the goals are great, but there's always going to be new horizons. And if all you care about is the next horizon, you're going to miss the whole thing, right? What Ferris Bueller say? What did Matthew Broderick say in Ferris Bueller? I'll butcher it to death, but life goes really fast. And if you don't take time to stop and look around, you're going to miss it. And that's so true in this entrepreneurial journey. And that I, I wish I knew that the way that I know it today, but I still don't think I fully understand it at the level I need to today. But I know I didn't when I was 24. The, I was perpetually dissatisfied. The added school. twist is you've dropped a lot of buoys, but that's very personal. So my judgment of how many buoys you've dropped doesn't mean anything because they're your buoys. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I love Dan and, and, and his stuff and uh, what a great thinker. Um, you're a good thinker. Anything else you'd like to share and wrap up today? Because I, I just think we've laid out some great thoughts. I'll make sure people can have access to your weekly email. We'll get the Rembrandt piece in. But... We'll wrap up with yeah. any closing thoughts you have, John. Yeah, I've got one final rant, and it's kind of in the same mindset. So it, I was 24 years old in 1990. I turned 24 in 1994. So, or 19, yeah. So I started the company when I was 24 in 1995, um, and then turned 25 that same year. And I so I went through the dot com run up. And I had lots of friends fresh out of college. I got out of college in 92. I had lots of friends killing it in that run up. And then obviously, you know, lots of booms and busts throughout. And I had a lot of like FOMO, like I'm missing out. I, I should be, you know, I should be invested in VC. I should be in private equity. I should be in dot com stocks. I should be this. I should be that. And I was always oriented around fundamentals. I still don't, I mean, I understand I'm in m and I certainly understand how venture capital works, but I can't live in a world where seven out of 10 failures is a success and one out of 10 home runs in VC is a, is a total success. And I'm always fundamentals based. And I think the media and our peers and a lot of what gets the press in the business world isn't based in fundamentals and reality. And I, I always advise entrepreneurs to understand the fundamentals and don't get caught up in the, I'm, I'm doing less than I should be, or I'm behind where I should be, or why haven't I done a series C and a series D and why don't I have outside investors? And if we had another two hours, Chris, I could model out why, the most expensive capital is investment capital and why the fundamentals matter so much. Cause at the end of the day, all the unicorns, all the outlier stories, all the, you know, all the VC wins win because ultimately they're great at the fundamentals. And that for me is the skill that's more important than any other three times this week already. And it's only Tuesday. I've had this exact conversation with an entrepreneur that thought they were getting left behind by not having a venture backed sponsor by not, you know, being in it, it, running a capital raise, like, and they're running great fundamentals based businesses that are growing and successful and thriving. And they had some inferiority around what they perceive to be success. And I will tell you that most of those entrepreneurs that are raising capital that way and, and venture backed and everything else are being left at the altar when the ultimate exit events come because they gave up so much to not be fundamental space. They gave up so much to be venture backed or to raise a bunch of capital to stay the course and follow your heart around fundamentals is the last so put, rant. that's a four hour well, rant all by itself. Point to that is don't, give the equity, don't give up your equity. Don't give up your equity, right? Never. So, never. Hey, 
Fight you like can all, you don't have to answer live, but I'd love to have you back for that two hour rant. That sounds like more fun and great radio. Uh, I know we're both busy, but I I absolutely I'd love to. We call it the Mark Zuckerberg effect. For every Mark, there's nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine that that died in the ashes trying to be Mark, and it's not a healthy way to try and build a growth company. But you know. My, I'm an opinion of John, one, makes, Chris, but that's just a strong makes a one great for me. tweet, though. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, I know. We're not all going to be Elon, and we don't no, want to be. No, I, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that, right? Um, John, this has been superb. I want to thank you for the gift of your, of your time and your ideas, um, and I definitely will have, would love to have you back, and thank you very much for your, for your, for your gift today. Last year, my dad, Alan Burkhardt, and I released our book, Opposite the Crowd. It's January 2024, and we've released the paperback version of the book, and it's now available on Amazon, along with hardback, Kindle, and audio formats. We've adjusted the price to be more accessible for everyone. On Audible, it will cost you a credit, or you can pay outright. If you'd like to get the audio book a little cheaper, you can look at Spotify and other outlets that sell audio books. We have the links to where you can find it in the show notes. So take you straight to it. And opposite the crowd. If you want the life you want, you got to know who you are.